Just wanted to give you a quick update. Um, this video is about the PranaView Aura Goggles. Um, recently we've had a lot of questions about that, so I want to just make an effort to get back to you. Uh, you have questions like, is it real? Uh, does it work? Um, have I heard anything new? So I'm just going to cover uh, some brief bullet points to address the recent questions. Um, so yes, it does work. Um, it is real. Um, if you check the comments section in the video below, you'll find a link. Um, there's quite a lot of information that's compiled there. Uh, I'll just describe a few things from that. <coughs> um, there's a reason that it works. Uh, all that's going on there is a different part of the eye is being conditioned to see a different uh, wavelength of light. Uh, so the reason that you can see uh, some pretty remarkable things uh, is because you're essentially uh, physically exercising the eye in a way that it would normally never get exercised. Um, okay, so as far as updates go, uh, as many of you know, especially if you've seen the, our webpage on this, <clears throat> the original developer uh, vanished. And uh, nobody was able to get in touch with him. Uh, I know I wasn't able to. Um, and he just never resurfaced again. So people have asked, you know, how do you get these things? Um, are there any other suppliers? Apparently, <clears throat> uh, there's been someone in Russia uh, for a number of years now that appears to have made, uh, what, you know, a similar device. And people have asked me, do I know if it's authentic? And my answer has been, I don't know. Um, I haven't had any correspondence with them. I don't know what their process was. I do know that other people like myself that were in touch with the original developer have said that they don't think that it's, you know, it, it's not the same quality of product. Uh, you know, um, and my guess is there's probably some truth in that. So uh, I'll just give you a little bit of background. Back in 2010, uh, I was in correspondence with the original developer, Tom. And nice guy. Um, I had found him, I was doing research, our Sound of Stars Frequencies technology group. Uh, the members have a lot of different interests, and one of the interests that we were pursuing back then, and, and still do, um, is what kind of reaction happens, um, you know, uh, with a biological organism in response to different, you know, ranges of frequencies. Uh, that's a very general description. Um, when you get down below the microwave uh, level wavelength, uh, you, you start to uh, <clears throat> discover some pretty interesting phenomena. And so the reason that the aura goggles do what they do is because they filter light uh, to a wavelength of between 400 roughly and 600 nanometers. Uh, and that's referred to as the as sc uh, scotopic vision. Um, there's certain animals that operate in that range, like you have different kinds of moths, things like that. The reason that we wanted to uh, explore that is we've seen interesting reactions uh, in different uh, lab tests from our frequencies. So we've seen things like the behavior and blood change. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, skin conditions change. Um, We've done we've done a lot of testing, uh, you know, thermally, um, you know, electrodynamically, uh, you know, measuring surface charge um, variance when we've applied frequencies. And so, um, when I first came across Tom's stuff, I probably came across it when I was researching just curious effects within different frequency ranges. Uh, and when I stumbled across his site. Um, I thought it was very interesting and intriguing because of the depth, the clarity, um, you know, how uh, comprehensive it was. It was a real serious scientific study. So he'd gone back 
into the history of this phenomena really well, documented it really well, um, and then began to describe his own experiments of trying to replicate um, what you know what had happened apparently back in the 1800s. Uh, the impression I had of, of his original site was it was basically mostly a private group. Um, I think there were somewhere between 40 to 80 people in there. They seemed like mostly academic, uh, you know, mostly academics, like hard science academics. Um, a lot of people that were into metaphysics were on there. Um, it came across basically like a metaphysical type group that were seriously studying uh, different um, odd subjects. And so this Tom was one of the guys in there. I think he ran it. His main interest was in duplicating things like the Boddington effect. Um, that source has been gone off the internet for a long time now, but you can still access it through the Wayback Machine. If you go to the uh, to the link in the comment section below, you'll find it. He, his site was called primummobile.org. If you stick that in the Wayback Machine, you'll get access to a lot of the stuff that he had made public. There were certain um, areas of his re research that he had uh, closed off to the public. You had to be in their inner circle to access it. My guess is that there might have been some technical advances uh, that he had made that he was only sharing with a small group of people. Um, but there's more than enough information if you if you can get this through the archive. To, if you if you have a serious interest in this, um, then there's really quite a lot there that should get you going. Um, and again, like the reason that we were exploring, like it's, you know, it's an interesting concept, but probably a lot of you have different reasons for being interested in it. You know, our, our main interest was just seeing if we could be able to visualize uh, dynamics of frequency effects, um, if we could just actually view these from a different wavelength. Uh, I have an original copy. My relationship with Tom was a good one. Um, I had contacted him, we started a dialogue. I still have my entire dialogue thread between them. He sent me a bunch of information. I'm guessing some of it's probably not public. Um, and what he what he offered, and I asked him if, if he could provide a modest discount to our members for, when I contacted him, he was just finishing his prototypes. So the prototypes were working, he was happy with the results, and he had just started I think he had had two in-house, like industry cottage style product runs. I can't remember for sure, but I think uh, the last I was in contact with him, he'd already had three batches. Two of the batches had gone out. He had some in the shop. He was working on a third batch. And I said to him, you know, uh, I'd like to get my members interested in this because it's right in line with, you know, what their pursuits are. You know, can you send me a pair of these so I can evaluate them? And then I'll market them to, to my to my members at the discounted price. And so he said, "Sure, uh, no problem." So I I, I got uh, one of the uh, one of the third batch runs. Uh, so it's in a little box. I've had it now for over ten years. It's a fantastic device. Right, uh, I think it was shortly after I got my Aura goggles. There's something that happened. Uh, I suspect to Tom. And there was stuff going on, I think, globally and locally. And so I remember that we were delayed in some of our uh, the experiments that we were in. So uh, <clears throat> I was in contact with Tom intermittently through whatever that was. I just can't remember what it was. And you know, I got assurances from him that everything would be OK and we were still going to go ahead. But I think something like six months had passed. And then I wanted to get back onto it, and I wasn't able to get a hold of him. So I thought that was odd. Um, and I just dropped it. You know, th this was a side project. It wasn't like a main pursuit. It was super interesting. Uh, at that time, uh, I didn't, in order to use these goggles and get results, you have to, it's like exercise, right? Um, you have to use them every day for at least a week or two. You have to use them for basically a minimum of about 30 to 40 minutes a day. And for me, it's like I have so much to do. I just, I have not physically had the chance. I can't justify to myself with all the other tasks that I have to do 
to put that at the top for that period. I regret that because I know that it works. And you know, it seems like if you use it long enough, <clears throat> you can you can see these visual effects without the goggles um, because it conditions your eyes. So that that's a real trippy, uh, you know, ability to have. Um, so yeah, I, I my boxes stay dormant. I keep it in a safe place. I hope to maybe even this summer uh, start getting back into it again. Uh, I've been contacted by a number of people that are interested in this. They've shared information and asked questions. Uh, I have stayed in touch with some people that knew Tom uh, back in the early days, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, we've been in touch intermittently. <clears throat> There's one guy from Australia who uh, I think did a really good job evaluating this stuff. Um, you can find his stuff online. Just just search Prana View Aura Goggles. Um, nobody knows what happened to Tom. Uh, I got an email about a year ago from someone who claimed that he'd found him. Uh, at the time, uh, I, I don't remember responding to him because the whole issue was a bit spooky. And um, I didn't even know who this guy, I had no idea who this guy was. I'm sure he was a good guy. Uh, but I just, you know, I did just recently respond to him. So I hope he reaches it back out. But the guy from Australia had contact, contacted me a number of times. I think he'd probably seen our webpage online and asked if I knew anything, and I didn't. Um, so for those of you <clears throat> that are wondering, you know, for me personally, I have no idea, you know, what happened to Tom. Um, he just, like, uh, there was a thorough search online, and we tried emails, uh, but he was just, there was no trace of him. Like, no trace anywhere. Uh, he was an IT consultant, a professional IT consultant. I believe he had his own consulting firm. I think there's actually an interview, a brief interview, where he's talking about something philosophical or something online. I can't remember what it is. Uh, but if you search his name <coughs> on YouTube, you'll probably find it. Um, but it's an old video, and it's before, obviously, he vanished. So I hope that helps. And again, about the Russian device, I don't know. Uh, another viewer sent me a link, uh, which looked really interesting, to a scientific journal uh, that looked like it was documenting the dye. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, or if you do know, the key elements here is a dye called dikyanin. Um, it was classified uh, and restricted to public use back in the 40s. You couldn't get it. And then uh, I think when, it, you know, a long time later, they did allow public access. <clears throat> there were different grades of it, and the ones that were the ones that you would have wanted were really expensive. For some reason, it was, like, stupidly expensive. Um, but apparently, I haven't checked it out thoroughly yet, uh, but the one fellow that sent me the link, it appears to be an article that documents how to create the dye. Um, but that's, that's pretty much all I have. You know, uh, it's a super interesting topic. There's a lot of worthwhile phenomena to um, investigate in those wavelengths optically between 400 roughly and 600, and 600 I think 680 uh, nanometers. So, you know, if you're interested in it, 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 you can't get Tom's goggles anymore. I mean, I think occasionally somebody surfaces on eBay, but one pair of goggles. The last one I saw, I think it was selling for something like three to four thousand dollars U.S. So they're a rare item. Uh, if you have one in your possession, keep it safe. Um, there's one other thing. Uh, one other thing I should mention. Um, this is for those of you that have contacted me and expressed a serious interest in this particular subject. Um, how do I say this uh, diplomatically? and with empathy and sympathy. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of people out there um, that come across our material <clears throat> and they have a serious interest in either the work that we're doing or aspects or just things that we've talked about. And so one of the things that I see is that you have these people that are working independently to explore forbidden science, which I think generally is a good thing. Um, but they don't really have a way to network. And I'm not always at liberty to connect them. 
and I think to myself sometimes, like, you know, when I read different people's emails, I think to myself, geez, it would be good for these people to, you know, maybe connect and communicate because they have the same interests and maybe they could help each other out. But if you're a private independent researcher, um, whether it's you know, like a hobby form or you're, you know, this is like a big focus or whatever it is you're doing, uh, often when you're exploring these areas, understandably, you want privacy. So I, I don't ever feel at liberty to just, you know, send someone someone else's email without them knowing each other and certainly not um, if there's no uh, knowledge of the other person's identity. Uh, I know a lot of, I know that there's people that watch these videos uh, just, you know, because they find it interesting or maybe it's entertaining and that's, that's totally cool. I mean, every journey starts with, you know, a step, right? Uh, but if you're someone that's uh, putting some time, effort, and energy into this particular subject, what I would suggest to you is place a comment below and just state that. Just say, because uh, if you, basically I want to take it out of my hands, right? I don't want to have to be the, the person that connects people that don't know each other, even if they should be connecting. I don't mind doing that sometimes in certain situations, but if somebody contacts me, um, but I don't know who they are and I don't know, you know, the kind of person they are or their history. Um, but they seem like a really good person. Uh, then it's, it's, it puts me in a potentially challenging situation if I connect people. Um, you know, so uh, I'd like you to do that for yourself. Uh, so there are people that... Um, have written in and they're at, they're actively working on trying to replicate this process and I know that they probably would welcome collaboration or at least I suspect they would it's always good to have more than one mind working on a problem um, and it's great if you have you know uh, compatible talents or you know if you've got expertise that you can support each other in that so you know if you want to reach out to other people then just do that you know, like if you want to reach out to other people, um, just say, hey, I'm working on such and such. You know, here's how to contact me. Uh, then, you know, you guys can take on the due diligence of, you know, scrutinize the people that are contacting you. Determine for yourself if you want to work for them. You know, or rather, just determine if you want to work with them. Um, you know, uh, there's not a whole lot more um, that I can provide content wise on this subject. Um, I'm, I've pretty much given you guys, you know, enough to kind of go on. Uh, I'm not currently in a position to, to put a lot of time and energy more into this. It's still a huge interest of mine. I'll do some hobby tinkering with it, but you know, my, my main focus is on, on the sound of source frequencies. Uh, but I welcome, you know, if you find something that you think is meaningful or worthwhile, or you want some feedback, um, you know, that, that's awesome. I'd love to hear of what you discover. So that's it for now. Doc Stars over and out.